Welcome to the 11th presentation in the fourth webinar series presented by the International Absorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing um, absorption as a solution to scientific, engineering, and human welfare challenges through the promotion of absorption research and education. We thank everyone for attending the webinar today. The webinar series has be, uh, been an immense success and the recordings of previous webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube and Billy Billy. This is the 11th webinar of our fourth series, which we will continue to have monthly throughout the year. We intend to continue with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other research institutes, as well as PhD students and early career researchers. Announcements regarding the fourth series will be distributed through the IS mailing list and the IS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be given by Dr. Benoit Clausen at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Grenoble, France. I am uh, Nicholas Wilkins at Svante Technologies Incorporated in Canada. Today's webinar will be moderated by David Donacci at Imperial College London in the United Kingdom. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other moderators are not necessarily those of the IES or institutions associated with those individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our dues are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal, Adsorption, contribute to travel grants, and workshop seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of adsorption. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials through our journal, as well as the Adsorption database published by Springer Materials. Anyone can follow the IAS on Twitter at intadsots for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please help us expand our YouTube channel by liking this video and subscribing. I'll now hand it over to David, who will moderate the YouTube Q&A. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Benoit Kwan to today's webinar session. Uh, Benoit uh, obtained his PhD in physics in 2003 on capillary condensation in nanoporous materials. Uh, then from 2003 to 2005, he worked as a postdoc with Professor Keith Gubbins on freezing of nano confined systems in the US. Uh, Benoit was then appointed CNRS researcher in Montpellier in 2005 and was promoted to CNRS research director in 2015. During a three-year visiting stay, he led the fundamental research group on multi-scale modeling of adsorption and transport in the CNRS MIT lab at MIT in Boston between 2012 and 2015. He is currently CNRS research director in the interdisciplinary physics lab in Grenoble, France. He is also a permanent affiliate of the theory group at the Institut Lauer Langevin in Grenoble, uh, the world's leading facility in neutron science, where he is in charge of scientific advances related to soft matter. He is also currently appointed attaché uh, aux sciences for viola water technologies. Benoit was co-founder and the first president of the French Adsorption Society and is currently French chair of the French German Adsorption Group. Benoit's research on adsorption, confinement, and phrase transitions in porous materials cover a broad range of confined systems from atoms, molecular fluids, electrolytes, and ionic liquids, as well as solids. During the webinar, questions can be submitted to the speaker as um, comments in the YouTube live chat, uh, and I will moderate those and, and pass them on to Benoit at the end of the presentation. With that, um, I welcome Dr. Benoit Kwan again and pass over the presentation to him. Yes. And it, okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, uh, thank you very much for the, the kind of invitation and also the kind introduction. So let me share my screen. Okay. 
point. Uh, okay, so yeah, thank you very much for the, the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing uh, in the last, let's say, five, 10 years, but absorption and transport in nanoporous materials, especially what I would call the, the view from the nanoscale. So as you as you will see, we're going to use a lot of uh, uh, statistical mechanics, uh, including uh, molecular simulations, such as Monte Carlo techniques, molecular dynamics, etc. So I would like to acknowledge my uh, my coworkers, especially some uh, students, Vanda and uh, postdocs, uh, Colin and uh, Alex. So let me give a very short introduction. So I know that this introduction, of course, is a bit uh, uh, naive for the uh, adsorption community, but just to make sure that we, we share the same definition. So uh, what I call a nanoporous material is a system like this one, where you have some solid domains in gray that coexist with some uh, pore void in black. And by construction, because we call these materials nanoporous materials, that means that one of the pore dimension at least is at the nanometer scale. So when you work with these materials, uh, from let's say a physicist point of view, there are uh, two very important features. The first one is the very large surface area, so typically with nanoporous materials like uh, zeolites or active carbons, you can reach something like a few uh, thousand square meter per gram. And of course, this is important because it means that when you confine a liquid inside these uh, nano cavities, uh, you see that uh, most uh, liquid molecules interact with the uh, solid skeleton and not so much, in fact, as we will see later in this presentation, with the uh, other fluid molecules. And the second important property, which I already mentioned, is the, uh, the the confinement itself. So the fact that one of the pore dimension is at the nanometer scale. And this, in the, the physics of liquids, is extremely important because it, this uh, uh, scale, nanometer scale, is typically of the order of uh, uh, the range of intermolecular forces that are uh, responsible for the cohesion of liquids. So for instance, if you take liquid water, typically beyond one or two nanometers, uh, water molecules barely interact with the other molecules. So you understand that if you confine a, a, a liquid like water inside these uh, nano cavities, you are introducing a sort of uh, interaction cutoff uh, that is going to produce some new effect. So basically, because of these two reasons, so the, the large surface area and the confinement effect, uh, there is a, a uh, um, many uh, new uh, adsorption and transport phenomena, uh, especially uh, in terms of transport. Uh, usually, you know, if you if you do look at transport in porous materials, you use uh, continuum level approaches such as hydrodynamics. But here, of course, in a nanoporous material, uh, you can no longer ignore the uh, interplay between uh, adsorption, which is the thermodynamics of the liquid at the at the surface and, uh, and the, the, the fluid flow, so the dynamics of the flow. So because of this, uh, uh, you have many new uh, effects. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details today, but you can mention slippage at the surface, uh, interfacial transport, and also non-discuss effects that I will not discuss today. But basically, the, the, the message that I want to, 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 to bring today is that uh, because of this uh, confinement and surface effect, you have a complex hydrodynamics, which is mostly due to the fact that you have adsorption, in fact, at the, at the surface. So the goal of my presentation today is to show you some uh, 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 theoretical and molecular modeling works that we've been doing on adsorption and, and transport of fluids in these uh, nanoprost media. I will uh, uh, split my presentation in two parts. First, I will show... Uh, I will discuss the thermodynamics of fluids in nanopores. And then I will uh, present some work in the second part on transport in uh, what I would call sub nanoporous materials. So we're going to uh, see mostly uh, zeolithic materials where the, 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 the size of the cavities is even smaller than one nanometer. So a few intron typically. So let me start with the, the first part on the uh, thermodynamics of uh, of fluids in nanopores. So I'm going to start with a, a very old uh, uh, work. I mean, a quite well established, uh, uh, a well established picture, I would say. So, like I said in the introduction, I'm a theoretician. So what I do is a lot of molecular modeling. Uh, so when you work with porous materials and gas absorption in porous materials, the uh, uh, let's say natural thermodynamic ensemble that you have to consider is the open system, which we call in statistical mechanics, the grand canonical uh, ensemble. So in this ensemble, it's fairly simple. So you have a, a system with a constant volume. So this is the porous material 
uh, with the uh, adsorbed phase. And it is in equilibrium with an infinite reservoir of bulk molecules that imposes the temperature and the chemical potential. Now, of course, if you fix for, uh, uh, for a single fluid, if you fix the temperature and the chemical potential, you also fix the gas pressure. So that's why usually we plot uh, the adsorption isotherm as a function of pressure and not chemical potential. But let us keep in mind that, you, in fact, what you impose in these experiments or in these uh, molecular simulations is a chemical potential. So in this ensemble, since you impose the chemical potential, what you measure is the what we call in the thermodynamics the conjugated variable, which is uh, the number of molecules in the system. And you measure typically uh, these adsorption isotherms, so the number of molecules in the system as a function of chemical potential, or I, as I just said, uh, the, the, the gas pressure. So P0 here is the bulk saturating vapor pressure. So this is the pressure at which uh, in bulk condition, you transform all your gas phase into the liquid phase. So usually if you take a, a nanoporous material, you observe, uh, this is simulation, but I could find some uh, example, of course, with, uh, I mean, experimental uh, samples. Um, so here it starts at low pressure with the uh, rapid adsorption at low pressure of an adsorbed film at the pore surface, as you can see here. So this is a cylindrical pore, but uh, I show you here a slide so that you better see the uh, adsorbed phase. And um, as you form the first layer, you see that if you keep increasing the pressure, you increase the film thickness, but you see that the slope here is lower because of course, as you adsorb at an increasing distance from the surface, the interaction potential between the fluid and the solid becomes uh, weaker because you have larger distances so that you have to increase more the pressure uh, to, to produce the same uh, increase, let's say, in the uh, adsorbed amount. And then uh, at a pressure much below, you see the, the, the bulk saturating vapor pressure, you have capillary condensation. So it means that this adsorption becomes unstable and you completely uh, fill the porosity with the liquid phase. So you have a discontinuity here. Now, starting from the uh, filled uh, porosity, when you decrease the pressure, you see that you have capillary evaporation at a much lower pressure so that you have this huge uh, hysteresis loop, which is also observed uh, in uh, most uh, experiments on the nanoporous materials. So usually in the literature, if you look at the at the theoretical framework to describe this, you have two, uh, let's say, very old uh, theories. One is the BET model that we use to, to estimate the surface area. Uh, it's simply, uh, uh, in statistical mechanics, an uh, Ising-like uh, model. And this is used to describe the formation of an adsorption. And for the capillary part, we use a Kelvin equation, which is simply uh, uh, obtained by writing the Laplace pressure condition. So it's the fact that you have uh, pressure equilibrium here, so that the pressure difference between the liquid and the gas phase uh, compensates uh, the surface tension term. So gamma is the gas liquid surface tension and D is the pore size. So it's basically the, the meniscus that you see in the, in the tube lab. If you add to this condition the chemical potential equality, because of course the number of molecules going from the gas to the liquid uh, is the same as the number of molecules going from the liquid to the gas. So you have chemical equilibrium. You end up with the uh, Kelvin equation. So I'm not going too, too much into this detail because this is well known. But in fact, so you see that here you have two, uh, let's say, uh, theories. But in fact, uh, it was recognized by a, a long time ago by uh, Daria Agin, a Russian physicist, that you can actually combine the two pictures. So the, the absorption of a film and the uh, uh, capillary condensation. So for this, you consider the system. So you have the, the solid phase with the, uh, so L stands for liquid, but it's the uh, adsorbed phase. And then you have the gas phase in the middle. So let's take a, a cylindrical or slit geometry. It's not extremely important for, for the derivation. And we know that in this grand canonical ensemble, which I recall is the uh, uh, open uh, ensemble in, uh, in thermodynamics, uh, you know that what you have to minimize is the grand potential, which is the sum of the, pressure time volume terms for the gas, for the liquid, the two surface tension terms, so between the gas and the liquid and between the liquid and the solid. And if you stop here, so these four terms, if you minimize this, you get basically um, uh, the Laplace pressure and the Kelvin equation that I discussed before. But it was recognized, as I said, by uh, Darien, that if you want to describe adsorption here, you need to include uh, a, four, uh, fifth, 
term here, which is also a surface potential, which describes the interaction between the solid and the gas through this uh, liquid layer. So I'm not going too much into the detail, but uh, this, uh, this uh, surface potential term is responsible for adsorption, and it's related to what we call the disjoining pressure. And it's called disjoining because it's the fact that this uh, uh, surface potential makes the uh, interface uh, disjoining, so it grows, basically. Uh, so that's why it was called uh, disjoining by uh, Dariagi. So you can use different shapes for this surface potential, but the uh, uh, simple and easy one, actually, is to use a simply uh, exponentially decaying function. So T is the fin thickness. And here you see, I'm simply using that basically, as the fin thickness uh, grows, uh, of course, molecule gets absorbed at larger distances from the solid so that uh, it decays with the distance. And Xi is basically the range, as I said uh, in my introduction, the range of these intermolecular forces. So it's typically of the order of uh, angstrom and, uh, nan or nanometers. So does it work? So here I show you uh, a simulated adsorption isotherm for a large pore. And uh, so the solid, uh, sorry, the symbols are the simulation. So Monte Carlo simulation, like I showed in the previous slide. And the red line is the model. So you see that we have a very good model that describes both uh, the adsorption of a film here and, uh, and capillary condensation, including the hysteresis loop. So this is for one pore size, but of course you can run this uh, once you have a, uh, I didn't go into the detail, but you have a, a fitting parameter here, which is the, 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 the spreading constant. And of course, this parameter is a, is a constant. So it depends on the nature of the fluid and the solid, but for a, a set of uh, fluid and solid, uh, it's a constant. So once you have it like here for, for a, an adsorption isotherm, you keep it constant. And you see that here we verify that when you change the pore size, uh, you get a very good agreement in terms of uh, capillary condensation pressure when you compare so the simulations, which are the, the, the blue uh, symbols, the red line, which is again the model, and the crosses are some uh, experiment done by my colleague uh, in Montpellier, uh, Anne Galarno, who did some experiments on the nitrogen adsorption at 77 Kelvin in uh, uh, nanoporous silica, uh, the MCM41, which is this... Uh, uh, material with a cylindrical uh, porosity. So we have a very good model. But now uh, I want to go one step uh, beyond by looking at the temperature behavior. So let's say that uh, first we take, uh, so again, this is the adsorption isotherm, like uh, those that I just uh, shown to you. And you see we decrease here uh, the, the pore size at constant temperature. And you see that when you decrease the temperature, the hysteresis loop shrinks becomes narrow, narrower. So here you see that it's, you still have a hysteresis loop, but it's very small. And if you keep decreasing the, uh, the size of the porosity, you, you, you start, uh, you enter the, the regime of a uh, zeolitic material, for instance, and you see that the hysteresis loop disappears. And more than this, you see that uh, the adsorption becomes uh, continuous and reversible. So you no longer have the, the jump here in the adsorbed amount. So that means that if you turn your head to, to the left, you can draw a sort of, uh, you see a red envelope like this with a big point here, which is a sort of critical point. So it means that for large pores, you have two coexisting states. So you have a gas phase uh, at low pressure, like here with the nuts of film. Then the porosity is filled here with the liquid. But you see that below this, uh, we call it a pseudo critical point. Uh, so critical diameter DC, you see that below this critical diameter, you can no longer define a gas-like or liquid-like phase. You have a heterogeneous phase. And in fact, you can do uh, you can do the same experiment, but this time, instead of uh, keeping constant the temperature and changing the pore size, you uh, keep the pore size constant and you change the temperature. So in black, it's the, uh, uh, so that's the temperature a density phase diagram. So in black, it's for a bulk liquid. Uh, so you have below the critical point, you have phase coexistence between the gas and the liquid. And you see that when you confine the same fluid in a pore size uh, D, you're actually shifting this critical point TC 
to what we call TCC, which is a, a critical capillary uh, point, as we call it. So, I mean, this is still a, an ongoing debate uh, whether it's a true uh, uh, critical point, like for the for the bulk uh, fluid. But uh, clearly, this is something very general. So it was predicted a long time ago by Bob Evans, who is a, a, a theoretical uh, physicist in, a, in of liquids, and he predicted that the shift here in the critical point when you confine is basically uh, proportional to the reciprocal of the pore diameter. So here's the, pretty, the, the change between TC and TCC uh, normalized to the bulk critical point as a function of one over the, the pore size. And you see that, uh, uh, so here, sorry, it's the R is the, the, the pore radius. So that's why you have a factor two. But uh, so it was uh, predicted by Bob Evans. And you see in white here, all the symbols, there are different experiments that we could find in the, in the literature. So it's not for a simple fluid, uh, a single fluid. I mean, you have many different fluids here, uh, water, nitrogen, argon, more complex uh, organic uh, phases, etc. And uh, you see the beauty of this plot is that uh, because it's uh, normalized, so here it's normalized to the to the, the, the bulk critical point. So that's why it's uh, it's dimensionless. And here to make this quantity on the x-axis dimensionless, you uh, normalize by sigma here, which is the kinetic diameter of the fluid. So by doing this, you can compare many different fluids. And you see that in agreement with the uh, theoretical prediction by Bob Evans, you do predict that you have a linear relation. And in red, I'm not going into the details, but it's uh, what we obtain using molecular simulation. So from our own work, but also from the literature. And again, you see that uh, it's not perfect, but we do uh, we do predict uh, 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 a linear relationship between the shift in the critical point. So this is an important message here that uh, uh, this is something that has not been uh, uh, that is still uh, let's say debated. But clearly, when you confine the fluid, you see that uh, you are also affecting the uh, the properties of the fluid. So Again, like I said, uh, it is not clear whether uh, this TCC point is a true uh, critical point, but but in terms of the, you see the physics of adsorption, you are clearly changing something when you uh, cross this critical diameter or when you uh, work at constant D and that you cross this uh, critical uh, capillary point. So one, another, another interesting uh, point that we, we we, we realized as we were working on this is what we call reminiscent capillarity. So like I said, in extremely small pores, let me go back. Uh, like I said, here you can no longer speak of capillary condensation because there's no jump in the uh, sub amount. So it becomes like it's a second order uh, phase transition. But still, uh, when you plot uh, the... So here, this is the, the filling pressure, okay? So here, instead of plotting the filling pressure, I'm plotting the, the chemical potential, okay? Uh, at which you observe the, the filling of the porosity. Uh, as a function of this uh, capillary uh, parameter, so one over D and here it's the, the surface tension. So it's basically Kelvin equation. So Kelvin equation is a capillary condensation uh, relation, okay? So it should only apply to uh, porous material where you have large pores so that you see capillary condensation. But still, if you consider zeolite material, so extremely small pores, less than one nanometer, and that you plot the data, you actually find that in agreement with Kelvin equation, you have a, a, a simple relation between, again, the, the, uh, the filling pressure. So here, again, it's expressed as the, the chemical potential. Uh, and this... Uh, uh, capillarity parameter, which again uh, involves the uh, reciprocal of the pore size, uh, D, and, uh, and the surface tension. And you see here what we did was to, uh, to look at different fluids. So very simple fluids, nitrogen, uh, hexane, and let's say more complicated fluid like uh, acetone or xylene. And again, we compared, uh, we considered only uh, small pores materials, so zeolites typically. And what is striking, so all the, the symbols, I mean, they correspond to, uh, so symbols correspond to different fluids and colors different materials. So we have uh, uh, 16 uh, uh, sets of fluids and solid. And you see that they seem to obey a simple, uh, a simple uh, capillary relation. So this is striking to us because, like I said before, based on this data, we did not expect 
capillarity. But here, even if you have a, a, a continuous and reversible pore filling, which suggests that this is not capillarity, you still observe uh, capillarity. So I'm not going to go uh, too much into the detail, but uh, uh, you can actually uh, uh, you can actually rationalize this again by uh, using this uh, Dariagin uh, equation. So I'm not going into the, the details, but if you solve the Dariagin model that I showed you, and uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, it describes very nicely uh, adsorption in, in pores where you have capillary condensation, uh, you see that, uh, so you can, I mean, if you derive the model uh, entirely, uh, you end up with this uh, equation. So this is again, the, the filling pressure normalized to the bulk saturating vapor pressure. And you see that you have as a leading term here, you have this capillarity parameter that I just discussed. And then here you have correction. So T is the film thickness at the onset of capillary condensation. And uh, Xi is the range of these intermolecular forces that are responsible for adsorption. So like I said, I don't want to go too much into the details, but uh, you can show in fact that uh, even in very small pores, you, are still, you still have a leading term, uh, which is this first one, uh, which is directly, if you prefer, a Kelvin equation. So, so the take-home message here is that even if you have uh, you have uh, uh, this uh, reversible and continuous filling, you still see you are still driven mostly by a, a capillarity uh, term. So here, uh, to go one step beyond, we we asked ourselves, okay. Now that we seem to have a, a consistent thermodynamic framework to describe adsorption in uh, large nanopores and small nanopores, can we go one step beyond by uh, being able to, to predict from a single adsorption isotherm at a given temperature, typically, uh, are we able to predict adsorption at different temperatures? So first, we did some uh, molecular simulation with my, uh, my students, uh, Vanda. And uh, so it's a very simple system, okay? Because since we wanted to test a, a simple thermodynamic model, we wanted to, to st stick to a very simple system. So here it's a, it's a methane adsorption at different temperatures. Sorry, there's a bug here, but it's from a room temperature, 300K down to 200K uh, in silica light. So pure silica uh, zeolite. So you get the, the typical uh, expected behavior. So as you increase the temperature, of course, you shift to high pressure uh, the uh, pore filling. So this was expected because as you increase temperature, you decrease uh, thermal energy. So you, 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 uh, sorry, when you increase temperature, you increase thermal energy so that you promote uh, desorption. And also you see that because the molar volume of the uh, fluid phase uh, increases with temperature, within the same porous volume, you can pack a fewer a number of methane molecules. So your uh, maximum adsorbed amount at saturation uh, decreases when you increase uh, temperature. So this is molecular summation. Uh, again, this is a, a simple system. Uh, so we wanted to compare with some experiments. So we did our own, uh, own uh, experiments. So the, the open symbols our, uh, correspond to our own experiments. And we also took uh, the closed symbols here, which are experiments from the literature. And you see that overall, we have a very good uh, model in simulation because uh, the, the uh, molecular simulation data are in a very good agreement with the uh, experimental data. So with this, we were happy because we have a, a, a simple system with a reasonable description using molecular simulation. And like I said to you, uh, the goal of this work was to, to, to check whether uh, thermodynamics uh, modeling could be used to predict adsorption at any temperature once you know a given adsorption isotherm. So for this, we went to a very old uh, theory, which is the uh, adsorption potential theory by uh, by uh, Polanyi. And it's a very simple uh, theory. So it basically uh, states that... Uh, that you, you, so you have an equilibrium between the bulk and the adsorbed phase, okay? So the chemical potential uh, of the gas with respect to the chemical potential at saturation is equal to the same difference for the adsorbed phase. So of course, mu zero is the same here because this is the chemical potential of the gas and liquid at uh, phase coexistence, which by construction is the same. So basically what I'm saying here is that you have in this theory, as always, uh, you, you write that you have chemical potential equality between the gas and the adsorbed phase. 
And then you add to this that uh, a molecule uh, will be adsorbed at a position Z here when the difference in the chemical potential is equal to the attractive potential here uh, that is responsible for adsorption. So basically, a long story short, you adsorb in a site, in an adsorption site of a given energy when you have this uh, chemical potential uh, condition. And the, uh, the beauty of this uh, uh, simple thermodynamic modeling is that once you, you have a given adsorption isotherm, uh, that allows you to, to derive uh, what is the chemical, the, sorry, the interaction potential U as a function of Z. And then, of course, you can do this. You can convert this into any other temperature. So in short, uh, the adsorbed volume, which is the number of adsorbed molecules time the molar volume of the adsorbed particle at a given temperature is independent of temperature. So if you measure it at one temperature, you can predict it at another temperature. So let's see if it, uh, if it works. Uh, so again, that's the same data as what I showed you before. So it's methane uh, in, a, in a null silica zeolite. So of course, in future work, uh, we, we, we want to to check that this also works for, let's say, more complicated fluids and more complicated materials. But because the thermodynamics is very uh, robust, uh, I don't see, honestly, I don't see any uh, good reason why uh, this simple modeling uh, should fail. So to show you that it works, so here we, we have, the, again, the, the five adsorption isotherms. So the, the symbols are the, are the simulation data. And I record that uh, we found a reasonable agreement with the uh, experimental data. So the, the, the star here means that when applying this adsorption potential theory, we actually used uh, the, uh, uh, the intermediate temperature here, 250K. So that's why there's a star. So the uh, green adsorption isotherm here is going to be our reference data. So the data that we use to, let me go back, to estimate this, uh, this function that is in the, supposed to be independent of temperature. And then, as I just explained in the previous slide, so once you have this set of data, so it's your reference data, you can apply the adsorption potential theory to predict the adsorbed amount at any pressure or chemical potential and temperature. So this is what we did. So starting from the reference data 250K, we predicted the uh, solid lines, and you see that we have a very good agreement with the uh, simulation data. So to conclude with this part, uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, model for me. It's quite old. I mean, we, we did not invent uh, this model. We just uh, took it from the literature. I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it does take quite some time to measure adsorption isotherms at many different uh, uh, temperatures. So here you have, uh, I mean, of course, I'm not saying that you, that you, you can avoid doing measurements at different temperatures, but at least you have a, a simple model that allows you to estimate, to predict uh, what you should observe at a different uh, temperature. Now, of course, uh, still, if you want to measure adsorption, iso um, heat of adsorption, sorry, uh, still uh, you, you need to do ads adsorption experiments at different temperatures, etc. So I'm not saying that you, that you no longer have to, to measure adsorption isotherm at different temperatures, but here at least you have a simple tool and you can use it in a different way, which is to check that your system is at equilibrium. Because for instance, if you, if you trust this uh, adsorption potential theory, you see that by comparing adsorption isotherms obtained at different temperatures, you have a mean to check whether or not your uh, experimental uh, data are at equilibrium or not. Okay, so like I said in my introduction, in the second part of my talk, I would like to, to, to discuss briefly uh, uh, the, the uh, transport part. Uh, so let's uh, stick for, for, the, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we're going to stick to the same system. So it's uh, uh, what I just showed in the last part. So methane, so a simple fluid uh, inside the zeolite material. Silica light, so it's uh, it's quite simple because it's an old silica uh, uh, zeolite, so there's no uh, there's no uh, aluminum to silicon um, uh, substitution, so there's no charge balance with some sodium or potassium cations. So again, the reason we use the simple system is uh, because we want to see uh, we want to check simple models to show that they are 
they can be used to predict uh, diffusion and uh, collective transport, so permeability of fluids in, uh, in materials. So usually what we do in simulation, which is what you also measure using uh, um, uh, NMR experiments, uh, is to you probe the uh, mean square displacement as a function of time. So it's very simple. Imagine that you have a fluid here at the time t equals zero. You are bas basically probing what is the distance, uh, the squared distance uh, traveled by the molecule over a time t. So when you reach times that are long enough, so typically here it's in femtoseconds. So here you are already at a one picosecond. So of course, from a, an experimental point of view, this is a very short time. But from a simulation point of view, what is interesting is you see that as soon as you have, let's say, so like I said, it's picoseconds, 10 picoseconds, 100 picoseconds. And you see that after like 10 to 100 picoseconds, you see a perfect linearity between the mean square displacement and the time. Okay. So this is typically the, uh, uh, the, the, what is expected for a Brownian diffusion or Fikian motion. Uh, that in the long time, when the molecule uh, collides with many neighbors, at some point, uh, its motion is entirely described by a, a simple random walk, if you like. And this is the uh, the spirit of this relation that was first established by uh, by Einstein, uh, that if you probe at long time the mean square displacement as a function of time, uh, the, 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 the constant here is directly uh, the, the self-diffusivity uh, as appears in the in the thick uh, equation for diffusion, okay. So it's directly the response of your molecules to a, a concentration gradient. So this is not uh, this is not from a, an engineering point of view. This is not the most important property because the self diffusivity is a self property. So it means that you are looking at a molecule, uh, its own trajectory. So still it is affected because you have neighbors, but it's not. Uh, the permeability. The permeability is a collective property. So it's the, the response of the fluid, uh, including of all the collective effects. But the cell diffusivity that you can probe using, uh, like I said before, uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, or neutron scattering techniques or molecular dynamic simulations is a very important quantity because it's a simple quantity that already contains a lot of information on uh, uh, interactions between the fluid and the solid, but also a fluid, a given fluid molecule with the other fluid molecules. So it's not the uh, permeability as you need, for instance, in chemical engineering experiments, but it's a key quantity to describe the, the, the uh, microscopic dynamics of your fluid. So let's see what we get. So like I said, uh, so you, you take the mean square displacement at long time. So it's uh, uh, linear. So here it's a, a log log scale. Uh, you measure the S directly from the from this data. So here I show you the uh, cell diffusivity of methane in silicalite as a function of the number of methane inside the, the cavity. So it's per unit cell. So here it's complete uh, filling, and uh, so so you have uh, different colors which correspond to the, to different temperature. And we see two uh, important uh, results. So the first one is quite expected. Uh, it's the fact that when you increase the temperature at a constant loading, uh, of course, you increase uh, the diffusivity. This is simply Arrhenius effect that uh, uh, molecular motion involves a free energy barrier to start moving. And of course, when you increase the uh, temperature, you increase the, the thermal energy so that be, uh, this uh, diffusion becomes faster. So this is, a, I would say, a trivial uh, result. What is interesting is on the other hand, you see that for a given temperature, when you uh, increase the adsorbed amount, you see that you decrease uh, the self-diffusivity. So I will come back to this because we have a simple model to, to explain this. But uh, before this, uh, let me look at the uh, at the uh, what I just said, so the uh, activation energy. So like I said, uh, usually the way you describe uh, the cell diffusivity as a function of temperature is using this Arrhenius plot. So you simply write that uh, the cell diffusivity is driven by this uh, exponential term. So delta F here is the, uh, so you have a molecule that is uh, adsorbed 
Uh, it has neighbors, which can be the solid atoms or the uh, fluid molecules. And to start diffusing, it needs to, at the beginning, it's blocked because it's interacting with the uh, inside a cage formed by the uh, other uh, atoms. And there's a free energy barrier that needs to be overcome so that the molecules, uh, the molecule starts uh, diffusing. Okay, so by measuring the collect the self diffusivity here at a given loading as a function of uh, of temperature, you can estimate this uh, this free energy. And what is interesting is for methane in silica light, you see that the the, the free energy barrier to to diffuse is actually quite small because. You see, it's a few kilojoules per mole, which is in fact extremely small because at room temperature, so 300 Kelvin, uh, the value here of KT, or uh, here it's the rare gas content, so it's uh, per mole, uh, it's 2.5, 2.4, 2.5 kilojoules per mole. So it means that for methane inside the zeolite, the, the free energy barrier is quite small. So that's consistent with the fact that uh, if you do experiments on the uh, uh, small alkane, so typically uh, methane, you usually don't really see uh, uh, transport barriers uh, because the the surface interactions lead to the to a free energy barrier that is quite small. So typically, room temperature is enough to largely overcome this free energy barrier. So now, like I said. We let me go back here. So we we still uh, I have explained right now the uh, temperature behavior, but still uh, there's one thing that we haven't explained, which is uh, in my view the, the most interesting part, which is the the, the simple uh, decay here that we observe as we increase uh, the adsorbed amount. So a long story short, we actually tried uh, uh, different models, and one model that works quite well is the uh, free volume theory. So the free volume theory was uh, it's like the uh, adsorption potential theory. It's quite old because I think it was uh, written in uh, uh, 1959 uh, or maybe 69, I forgot, but uh, more than 50 years ago. And um, and uh, it's a very simple theory, as you're going to see. Uh, it was actually uh, written for uh, uh, diffusion in glasses and in polymers. But here we found that it works quite well. So how does it work? It's a very simple uh, theory. So you basically have the zeolite phase, so with silicon and oxygen, and you have, you see here in gray, uh, methane molecules. And basically what you assume in this uh, uh, theory is that you need to have around a methane molecule, a cavity like here, that is large enough because if it's too small, of course, the fluid cannot go inside. So the cavity has to be uh, large enough so that the molecule jumps into the cavity. So it's a it's a jump diffusion uh, model, but that accounts for the free volume in the system. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's not an empirical relation. Okay. So what I'm going to explain here is an exact uh, equation. It's something that you can derive. The derivation is not simple, but it's actually not so complicated either. Uh, and you end up with this expression. So that's the self diffusivity of the uh, uh, methane molecule. Uh, the, the first coefficient here, so zero means for infinite dilution. So basically, you are looking here at the self diffusion for the uh, many uh, methane molecules. And this one is when you have a single molecule, methane, okay? So you have a lot of free volume here. And then this term is quite simple. So V mol is the volume occupied by the fluid phase. So it's directly proportional uh, to the adsorbed amount. This is what I'm writing here V mol. It's the volume occupied by the adsorbed phase, so it's directly proportional to the adsorbed amount. Because when you increase the number of uh, molecules in the system, of course, you increase the volume occupied by the uh, adsorbed amount. And Vf here is the free volume. So it's the so when you have at infinite dilution, it's the porous volume that we usually know. It's the amount of free volume in the system. And of course, when you increase the number of molecules in the system, the number of uh, methane, uh, you pay the price twice for diffusion because first of all, you increase the volume occupied by the fluid phase. So because you have a minus here that decreases your cell diffusion. And by adding these adsorbed molecules, you are also decreasing the free volume. So this is what I'm trying to write here, that the adsorbed amount, of course, increases 
with the uh, molar volume uh, occupied by the uh, fluid phase, but the free volume also decreases because you are uh, putting molecules inside the, the cavities. So basically, that's why I said you pay twice the price for the uh, for the, the in terms of uh, diffusion when you increase the number of molecules. So what we did, I see that I'm running out of time, but this is one of my last slides. So what we did was to to test this model. So basically, it's a very simple test in molecular simulation. So uh, you have a so this is a zoom on the uh, adsorbed methane in gray within the zeolite. And you see all the light blue points. It's basically mathematical points that you pick randomly. And then to count the, uh, the free volume, you basically count the number of blue points that do not overlap with methane or do not overlap with the uh, zeolite phase. Okay, So this free volume here is directly the volume of your box time the uh, the fraction of blue points that actually uh, uh, fall into a vacuum, if you like. Okay, So that gives you a measurement of the free volume in the system. And then, of course, you do this for every adsorbed amount. So does it work? So here I show you the free volume as a function of the, uh, of the adsorbed amount. Okay? So as expected, when you increase the number of methane inside the cavity, you decrease the free volume. And now here I show you the self diffusivity, okay, normalized to this uh, ds uh, zero that I showed before, as a function of this free volume parameter. So here, uh, so this is vf zero. You remember it's the pros volume, and vf is the pros volume when you have n adsorbed molecule in the system. So here on the right, uh, this is uh, at low loading, okay, and this is at high loading. So you recover. Uh, uh, with the open symbols, the simulation that I showed you before, that when you increase the adsorbed amount, uh, the uh, cell diffusivity decreases. And the line is actually the result from the model. So there's one parameter that we had to adjust, with the, which is this uh, gamma uh, parameter here in the theory, which is, uh, I don't want to go too much into the detail, but it's a, it's a geometrical parameter that takes into account the shape of the molecule. So it basically takes into account the fact that two adsorbed molecules share, uh, somehow they share uh, the same free volume. So that's why, so normally it should be one, let's say, but of course you need to take into account that two methane molecules uh, uh, share some free volume. So this parameter is not, uh, is not equal to one, basically. Okay, uh, and last thing before I conclude is, uh, so we wanted to, 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 I mean, because of course when you have this, uh, I would say general, uh, decay in the adsorbed amount, you could say that uh, that we, we were lucky, that uh, it was maybe a coincidence. So what we did was to apply the same theory, but uh, silicalite, for those that are familiar with this material, is uh, anisotropic. So you have cavities along uh, the y-axis. So this is what you see here, some cylindrical channels. And then in the x uh, z plane, it's not very clear to see, but you have what we call the zigzag channels, okay? So one is cylindrical cavity and the other one is sort of zigzag channels inside the uh, X, uh, Z plane. So what we did was to apply the same theory, again, uh, probing uh, with these uh, light blue uh, points, the free volume. And we checked, you see here that uh, uh, if you take the self diffusivity, so the three dimensional self diffusivity or the self diffusivity along the big channels Y or in the zigzag channels, Again, the line is the result from the model. And you see that with the same model, uh, we can actually predict the change in the cell diffusivity with the uh, adsorbed amount, or here the, the free volume parameter. And that in the three situations, we can describe uh, the, the, the change as a function of the free volume. So now I go to my conclusion. Yeah. So uh, the goal of my presentation today was to, to show you that uh, for both uh, adsorption and diffusion, so I didn't have time to, to discuss uh, transport, which is the, uh, I mean, permeability. So when you have a pressure gradient inducing the flow, but uh, I hope I convince you that we do have some uh, simple physical models that rely on very simple parameters. So most of the parameters that I showed you today, they are available to, uh, to, to simple experiments. So like, for instance, I mentioned the porous volume, 
Uh, usually we know the adsorption isotherm, et cetera, so that we can estimate the free volume, for instance. And, uh, and in particular, uh, I hope I convince you that uh, uh, in the specific case of nanoporous materials, so I, I spoke of uh, zeolite materials uh, today, but we, we also did very similar work on the nanoporous carbons, active carbons. And, uh, and as you can see, we have uh, some nice, uh, simple model like the Polanyi adsorption theory and the free volume theory that helps you to rationalize the data that you obtain uh, at different temperatures for both uh, adsorption and diffusion. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Benoit. Um, I appreciate the... Uh let's say more educational aspect of the talk. It was very useful for, for people like me who are not uh, experts in molecular simulation. Um, we have, are you happy to, to start to get into questions? Yeah, uh, thank you. We have um, one question from Shivam Parasha. Um, and they are asking, how well does the uh, adsorption potential theory work if your isotherm has hysteresis? Because in the examples that you showed for methane, it was a non-hysteretic isotherm. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I should have mentioned this, but uh, the, let me go back to the, to the slide. So as you understand, the, the key aspect, it, it's really an adsorption theory, not really a phase transition theory. So that's why... Uh, uh, yes. So here it works well because you 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 really need to 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 describe this uh, this adsorption potential. So it's that's why I said it's an adsorption theory. Now when you go into the capillary hysteresis, so you are governed by this uh, uh, Laplace pressure, etc., which is not included in the uh, adsorption potential theory because here uh, you, you, you don't have the surface potential. I mean, the surface potential is basically responsible for the adsorption part. The rest, uh, even if ad adsorption at the surface can modify, of course, the uh, uh, capillary condensation term, but the capillary condensation term is mostly driven by capillarity. That's why I mentioned this uh, this uh, yeah this uh, Dariagin model because the Dariagin model on the other hand uh, it's uh, has in its uh, roots the the all the ingredients to describe capillarity so in fact I think that the, one of the messages today was that uh, we do have models for everything uh, now indeed the adsorption potential theory is more for the low pressure part. But it, this is something you combine because, for instance, by predicting the Dariagin model uh, at different temperature, you should also recover for the low pressure parts so where you have the, the the film formation. You should also, I mean, it should also be consistent with the uh, uh, adsorption potential theory. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that answers your your question, Shivam. Um, and just one follow up from me uh, regarding that. Um, is that just a computational or time limitation as to why this isn't frequently done, or is there some other limitation or, or disadvantage in you, in combining the two? You, you're talking of combining uh, Dariagin and uh, and yeah, adsorption potential. It's it's a good question. I don't know. It's uh, I mean both are uh, quite simple to 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 use. I mean, okay. Like, Let's go into the details. So the adsorption potential theory. Uh, let me go. Yeah. Shivam gives his thanks, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So for the Polanyi theory, uh, th there's one subtle point, which is that uh, normally, if you follow what I said, uh, you could imagine that you could measure yourself U of Z which is the surface energy, I mean, the energy of a molecule at a distance Z. And we actually tried, because in molecular simulation, I mean, we have a force field that describes these interactions. And my student, uh, Vanda, actually tried. So we measured U of Z. And the bad news is that it fails. So it fails because it's the, in fact, what we call U of Z here is not exactly just the solid molecule interaction. It's, it includes the fact that when you have an adsorbed molecule here, for instance, the light blue, it also interacts with the other. So if you prefer, it's more like a, a, a free energy parameter. So that's why 
the 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 adsorption potential theory in its in itself should be uh, an exact theory but the problem is because of this approximation that it's not directly simply the uh, uh, solid fluid energy it includes also fluid fluid contribution it's complicated so that's why what we do is to take a, a reference data so one adsorption isotherm is used to predict the others because we basically write that it includes in its uh, DNA, if you like, it includes all this term. So you don't have to calculate it. You use some reference data to predict this. So that's one of the, to answer your question, David, it's one of the difficulties, if you like, that it's not really, you cannot predict from scratch. It's not it's fully needed. generative. You need some yeah. reference uh, data. Exactly. Right. And that's why you use, the, you use the trick that you use uh, reference data. So now for there again, it's the same. It's not fully... Uh, uh, predictive in the sense that, uh, so like I said, the, 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 you know, to summarize in one sentence, the key aspect in Dariagin's model is to use the, this term. So you, you basically add a coupling between uh, these two interfaces. So solid, liquid, liquid gas. If you don't put this, believe me, it's the typical Kelvin equation. So either your, uh, your, is filled with the gas or with the liquid. Oh, it's nothing. No gas yeah. yeah, it's Kelvin equation. So that's why when you use, for instance, for those that are sim uh, familiar, you use the BJH model, you take Kelvin equation and you correct for the thin thickness, which is kind of a, a ad hoc uh, correction to the problem. So here, the beauty of the Ayagin model is that it is included, okay? But there's always a, a problem, right? Which is that... Uh, you remember I said that you, you you can use this general form and we actually showed with my colleagues that it, it works quite well. But the problem is you have two adjustable parameters. S is the spreading parameter. So normally this one, you should be able to measure it, but it's not easy. And the Xi is the range of the intermolecular forces. So what we do in general, which is what I showed you here, is again, you take one adsorption isotherm from simulation or from experiments, and you're going to use it's like a sacrifice, if you like. You use this adsorption isotherm to estimate the two parameters. And then, of course, you can take these parameters. So to answer your question, David, it's perfectly uh, doable to combine the two models. And in fact, from simple thermodynamic arguments, they should be consistent, right? Because it's just thermodynamics that I use. But every time, there's a, there's a limitation, which is that you do need some reference data to first calibrate your model, if you like. Right, understand. And I think, um, thanks for the explanation. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that also partially answers the question uh, from Christina in, in the YouTube chat, mm -hmm. um, who's, uh, who is asking about, you know, the prediction of the isotherms at different temperatures and how you account for, you know, electrostatic interactions. And I think what you just described, mm -hmm. uh, addresses that so christina if that doesn't answer your question please clarify uh but but hopefully uh what benoit just described um addresses what you are asking um there is one other question actually from nick wilkins um who was asking about the diffusion estimation you were talking about towards the end um do you see any, do your estimations follow or approximate what most people call the uh, Darken relationship for diffusivity? So the, the, um, yeah. yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, <do> you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see, I see the, the question. It's a very good question. Yes, they do. Because in fact, so the, so the, the, okay. So here, what you measure, ds by construction, is the response to its thick equation. So it's the response to uh, concentration gradient. Now, you can always uh, use the response to a pressure gradient, then it's permeability, or you can write the, 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 the response to a density gradient. And then this is what is known as the transport diffusivity. I mean, different communities have different names. And this darken factor, which is a thermodynamic correction, it's the conversion between these two, uh, these three uh, uh, transport coefficients. So, uh, so what I'm going to say is very important. That uh, I would say to answer this question, that they have to verify this because if you don't verify this, 
it means that there's something wrong in your simulations uh, or that there's something wrong in the uh, experiment. So they have to, we, we recently uh, submitted a paper on this that, uh, because, I mean, uh, again, it's it's just from the uh, equation that if you convert a, a, a density or a concentration gradient into a pressure gradient, you have this uh, this darkened factor that arises. And therefore, if you put the right value, the one that is given by your adsorption isotherm, and in the simulation that I showed you here, as you could see, uh, we also have the adsorption part. So we know exactly this uh, conversion factor, and we checked that you get exactly the same value. But again, this is a, 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 I think it's a very good question because it's a strong argument that for me, uh, it's the same as what I told you with uh, using Polanyi's theory to check that your adsorption experiments uh, are at equilibrium. But somehow, if you don't verify this, especially with molecular simulation where we know exactly the system and that there's no, uh, we know exactly what we put in, we uh, you must verify this because it's a thermodynamic condition, you see? So it's a, for me, it's not a result. It's a, it's something that is uh, mandatory, I would say. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> with that, we have come to the end of our hour. Um, so I... Yeah, let's uh, let's wrap up. In in that case, um, we can discuss afterwards uh, between us uh, if we have other things. Um, so again, Benoit, I'd like to thank you for your for your time and presentation today, and and thank you to everyone uh, for for joining the webinar. And um, I'm now passing back over to Nick Wilkins, who will uh, give you the information of our upcoming talks. Excellent. Thanks, David. And uh, thank you, Dr. Cohn, for your presentation, uh, Molecular Simulation and Theory of Gas Adsorption and Transport in Nanoporous Materials. We hope all of our uh, attendees, we thank all of our attendees for joining this webinar and hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of this webinar will be posted on the IAS YouTube channel in Billy Billy with an announcement on the IAS Twitter feed. The hope is that the work discussed today will be a useful resource for the adsorption science community in the future. We'll be taking a break from webinars in December, but we'll restart in the new year. Announcements regarding the next webinar and other IAS online events will be posted on our Twitter feed and through the IAS mailing list. With that, we thank you for joining us and hope that you will join us again soon. <laughs>